Welcome to the debut episode of Philly Billy and French Vanilla. Here, that's the uh, agreed upon name. I thought we decided that we, we weren't going to call it. You're not calling it that. We're not. Go- we'll call it that, but we, I didn't think we were telling the public that. That's Don't what shouldn't people get to vote on that? All right, we'll make a poll. Philly P B and F V P B and F V. People will say it. All right, Doug Lay Maurice, Bill Landis. No, well. Philly Billy, Bill Landis, French Vanilla, Doug Le Maurice. We're back. And it's very hard for me to not say, welcome back to BT, because that's where we did it back in the day. And now we are going to be bringing this to you on a regular basis, wherever you are watching this or listening to this. It's in the feed for the podcast or the podcast, depending what mood you're in. And we are going to have shows that drop in that feed. But we are actually calling this show, Bill, what are we calling it? Kings of Columbus. And that's not a joke. That's real. Kings of Columbus, because it's Ohio State football, it's based in Columbus, and there might be some stuff percolating that that will come uh, become more clear why that's the name I down think, the road. I think if you're wondering why, uh, you'll figure it out eventually. It might take, yeah. a, while. It might take a while, but you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah. So Bill and I have podcasted together many times. We have not podcasted together in a long time since the 2018 season. Well, uh, no, you had me on for Buckeye Talk. For a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had for a, a guest. Had a guest spot. And you had a guest spot with, with me and Ari on 4 to 6. That is true. When you were promoing your book. But, but not matter. as not as co-hosts. Right. And so now we're going to be back doing this on a regular basis. We hope you guys join us. We hope we know you guys. The, the idea here is that if you – we're at Big Ten Media Days. We're going to talk about what Ryan Day said today. We're going to talk about the Ohio State Buckeyes and what they whether they have what they need to win a national championship. If you – liked what we did, what I did, what Bill and I did together, what I did for the past years when Bill left at Buckeye Talk, you'll like this because it's going to be that same kind of vibe. If you love the podcast and the podcast daily that Bill and Jeremy Birmingham and Austin Ward do and you're new to this, we hope you try this. If you are used to us but you don't haven't listened to Berm and Austin and Bill, like we're, we're in the same feed. It's going to be different styles of podcasts, some short. This will be longer. But, Bill, I think you're going to be involved in all of them. And the idea is not for the four of us, now that I'm here, to sit around and stare at each other and take turns in a 25-minute podcast of having four people try to talk. But we're all – it's more like a network. I've been trying to work this through my head that we we work for the same company. We're in the same feed, but there's going to be different shows within it. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way to think about it. Um, I, I want to maybe say off the rip that like everything you've come to expect from the podcast is not going away. Like We had a really good first year, I thought, with the Daily, with Bermanology, with Buck IQs, with the Rooster Show, with the Brian Heating and Cooling Show during games leading up or during the week leading up to games. Like All that is staying here. We're now adding on top of that um, with some other stuff that we're excited about. We're bringing you on board. We're going to do Kings of Columbus. We're maybe going to mix in some more broader Big Ten conversations. Um you kind of have a little bit of free reign, I think, to do, to do what you want, sort of added on top of what we've established over the last year. And it might end up in a spot where people feel like they want to pick and choose what they want to listen to out of the feed. That's perfectly fine. I think I think our aim is to give you everything you could possibly want from an Ohio State podcast, from the team coverage to the recruiting, from two guys kind of goofing off, talking about silly things, talking about non-football things. It's all going to be here. Um, and I guess it's, we hope you listen to all of it, but we're also not going to be offended if you don't. I know that people have have uh, particular tastes, and that's fine. We hope to serve them all. That's the goal. Serve everybody. If you're an Ohio State fan, you'll find something in this feed that you like, even if you dislike me. <laughs> because having parted a job where I was at, we're going to get to football in 10 seconds, where I was for 18 years. I got a lot of wonderful messages from people, Bill, and it was very humbling. I also got my fair share of, I used to hate you, or... You're annoying, but, you know, your annoying, but is going to be on my tombstone. But we're very grateful for anyone who's given this podcast a chance who listened to us previously. And Bill and I are very excited to be podcasting back together. There's a Marvin Harrison Jr. podcast that we're going to do because I was la- I was asking Marvin a lot of questions today about, as we record this at, at Big Ten Media Days on Wednesday, about expecting to be double teamed this season, what Ohio State can do to move him around, asking Ryan Day about that. It's not like you have a great receiver in the NFL or in college football, and you're like, well, they're double covering him. (laughs) I guess we can't throw to Jamar Chase. That's not how it works. But also there's a challenge there. We're not doing that as the main thing today. I do think there is something to talk about with a lot of the things that are percolating around the Big Ten and in a negative way, 
There's a lot of really good football stuff happening in this conference right now. I think this football conference is as healthy as I've seen it in 18 years doing this. There's a time to get to that. We're not going to do that today. We are going to talk about, Ryan Day talked about checking off boxes, Bill. And and I like when coaches come back refreshed. Hey, you had a vacation. You get to hang out with your family. We weren't being bombarded with a million things at once. What did you think? I'm very big into vibes. What did you think of like the Ryan Day vibe on Wednesday coming off a of summer, coming off a of Michigan loss, coming off taking Georgia down to the wire, coming off this recruiting class? Where did you feel like he was? Loose, comfortable. Yep. Um, I think there was an opening perhaps for him to be a little tightly wound. I'm sure like it's not just talking to us that they do here. They kind of get run through the ringer. They do a bunch of interviews. I'm sure he was asked a ton about losing to Michigan um, on Wednesday. And I think over time that can wear on you and put you in a little bit of a different mood and, and kind of close you up a little bit, but he did not seem that way when he talked with us. I, I think it's a, a, a guy who um, flipped the switch a little bit after the Michigan game last year and maybe realized that the, uh, the edginess that he tried to get out of his team, the like, I just, it just felt like super tightly wound all year last year, and and it didn't serve them well. And I think he is now with everything that he does moving forward since then, trying to avoid that, and that included just sort of like holding court, being comfortable, and, and frankly projecting a lot of confidence talking to us today. It's going to be interesting because you and I both covered this team. It was a really interesting season last year. Um, I don't. I only listen to my own podcast because I like yeah. the sound of my own voice. Uh-huh. So I don't know every thought that you have about how things unfolded last year. I would imagine you don't know every thought that I had about how last yep. year went. So I'm cur- I'm eager for us to get into that as we move into this season. Let me let me detour briefly. And and this is something that happens when you listen to podcasts here. There's a lot happening in college football. But our negatives, the the Northwestern hazing situation is something that it wasn't as dominant here maybe as I thought it would be. I came in with a plan of like, I'm going to ask every head coach about like, would you be aware of a situation like that and should you be? And I kind of didn't get to do that. So I don't know how much other people were asked about that. But when you have a Northwestern football program and frankly athletic department that is exploding, you have Jim Harbaugh in Michigan reportedly facing a four-game suspension for – not being truthful with the why do I say that? What lying? He lied. As as I was talking about it with somebody, it's like it's not dissimilar. To like Tressel, Jim Tressel wasn't truthful with the NCAA, and he lost his job yeah. as a result of it. It's like I'm not saying it's exactly the same thing, but there's stuff happening with Michigan, the national championship team, the Georgia Bulldogs. Again, tragically had an off season where a staff member killed a player in a car accident. And the staff member was also tragically killed. So I don't want to what about this, but this has been a place, right? Ohio State fans, it's not fun when your program is mired in off-field stuff. And the things I just mentioned, some are super serious. There's loss of life, and some of them is like NCAA rule stuff. But it makes it not as fun. And I would like to acknowledge, I say this, Bill, a lot of times in life, when something goes wrong, we complain about it. And sometimes when the same thing goes right, we just let it go by. It's an unhealthy way to live. You need to acknowledge the good or acknowledge the absence of bad. So should we, can we acknowledge the absence of bad for Ohio State in this situation? Because five years ago, we were here asking Urban Meyer, what's up with, you know, like, should we take the time to do that? Um, I mean, I'm appreciative of it as someone who, like, has to stay up till three o'clock in the morning when the bad does happen sometimes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. We don't we don't tend to give programs uh, the the credit maybe they deserve sometimes when they kind of get through a, a year um, without incurring those kind of. I mean, any kind of off field incident that, that draws negative attention, I suppose. Um, you know, it wasn't Ohio State had some stuff happen, like some real serious stuff happen to members of its program. Um, Colonel Tate lost his mother. A.B. Henry was battling cancer. Ryan Day talked about some of that on, on Wednesday. Like it was, it, it was a, a group of people that went through some stuff and had to, help, had to help each other through difficult situations. Um, but even that in itself, I think, is like to to have a. I, I, I always feel like talking about culture like can be a little cheesy, um, and Ryan Day talks about it a lot. But like I don't know, I kind of buy it from him. Like it feels it feels as genuine from him as it does from any other college football coach I've I've heard it from, if not more so. Um, and I think there was a lot of, of the program as a whole, like coming together and lifting some guys up through some difficult times while also 
navigating some of the pitfalls that can occur during a typical college football offseason. So, yeah, I think you should celebrate that a little bit. Listen, we call that when it happens. Yeah. I mean, like, wait, again, I've been in – I didn't get in a fight here at Big Ten Media Days. I asked Kirk Ferentz a question, but he didn't get mad. I think I adjusted my tone. You think he remembered you? I hope so. He had to have remembered you. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, and I asked him another question. I asked him a question at the podium, and I asked him a question at his breakout session. And we were just, we're good, we're good. You go through things, you know, and it just strengthens the friendship in the end. <laughs> but I've had fights here at Big Ten Media Days or, you know, confrontations with Jim Harbaugh, confrontations with Urban Meyer. And so, like, we just, notwithstanding, and of course we're not glossing over the absolute tragedy for Carnell Tate and the idea that his teammates and his, hopefully the fans of Ohio State will do whatever they can to lift yeah. up a young man who tragically had his mother killed um and avery henry's cancer battle which ryan day said is going to end his football career but again you just want avery henry to be healthy and he's in remission yep. and that's a great thing but then we got to talk about football so we got to talk about football with ohio state which is not always the case when you come and start a season let's talk football so let's talk football do we take commercial breaks on this podcast or no we do not no we do not no. so i can't say we'll talk about that next on philly billy and french vanilla I mean, you can, but then we'll just sit here awkwardly for like 10 seconds. All right, let's just do that. Let's talking. do three. We'll do it. Ready? And we'll do that next. I'm going to try this one out. On French vanilla. Can I go first? Would you be mad if I try French vanilla first? No, try it out. Yeah, see how it fits. We'll do that next on French vanilla and Philly Billy. Now, it's definitely better with you yeah. first. Okay, we're back on Philly Billy and French vanilla. Ryan Day talked about checking off the boxes, so we're going to check off boxes here. I have... A chart. Do you do the the immaculate grid? I sure do. The not, immacu- not well, but yeah. Do people do? I feel like it fits better. If you don't know what the immaculate grid is, as we talk about this, don't find out. It's not worth it. Do Wordle. Do something else that like tests your brain in a better way than like. Do you remember a guy from 1963 who played for the Tigers and played for the Cardinals? It's like, <laughs> why would I care about that? So I hate the randomness. You should go to immaculate grid to reference it. I hate the randomness of Immaculate Grid, but I like the ones that are statistically driven yeah. where it's like, I remember this person because they were good. I don't want to remember somebody who happened to play for the Los Angeles Rams and the New England Patriots. <laughs> but like, it doesn't mean they're good. So anyway, I made my own Immaculate Grid. I have offense, defense, and then I have three categories. So let's start first with offensive personnel. And we're going to determine, are they checking the box with offensive personnel to be a Na- legitimate national championship contender. And frankly, by the way, like Ohio State's national championship contender every year. So we're going to compare the Buckeyes against themselves. And we also, we're going to do a tackle podcast. We are going to do a tackle podcast. But Ryan Day was asked about tackles, was asked about quarterbacks. You have a stat, and I can't believe it's, I, I'm honored that you did research for our inaugural podcast of <laughs> Philly Billy and French Vanilla. What did you come up with with a quarterback tackle stat about experience that applies to the Buckeyes? Yeah, so I, I wanted to look at, and listen, you can like pick any two positions, I guess, but tackle and quarterback seem pretty important. Um, I looked at all 36 playoff teams that we've had and looked at the combined stats at that school for their quarterback and left and right tackle entering that season and tried to find a comparable for Ohio State, which is entering a season with a quarterback who has started one game a left tackle who started one game and a presumed right tackle in Joshua Simmons who has played but has not played at Ohio State. Um, and there aren't many teams that I think come even close to fitting that bill. There is not a team in the last three years, um, every playoff team has returned some combination of its starting quarterback and starting tackles. Not all three at once, but some combination of, of the three, some all three. Um, 2018 Notre Dame was is close. Like they had two new tackles that year. But Brandon Wimbush was their starter entering that season. He had started the year previous, but then like Ian Book supplanted him. Yeah. So that's like kind of the situation that Ohio State's in, but not really. Be, that'd be like if uh, I don't know some C.J. Stroud wasn't very good and was still around, and like Kyle McCord supplanted him this year. Yeah, so that would be the case. So they had a bad returning quarterback. They had a bad returning Is that what you would rather have? It's like, no. oh man, if only no. Ohio State had a bad returning quarterback, they'd be in great shape. No, I, I would not want that. Um, twenty seventeen Georgia was. Not quite the same thing. Um, Jacob Beeson was returning as a starter. He got hurt. Jake Fromm took over for him. So he was a, a new starter for the majority of that season. Yeah. They had a new left tackle, true freshman left tackle, and they had moved their one of their starting guards, as a win, to tackle. But he had at least started the previous okay. year. So he had started for Georgia prior to that season. Um, and then 2019 Oklahoma, 
had two new starting offensive tackles and a transfer quarterback in Jalen Hurts, who had technically not played for Oklahoma, but he started 28 games for Alabama before he got to Oklahoma. So even that's not really the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's like a long way of getting into if Ohio State does get to the playoff this year with what is essentially a brand new starting quarterback and two brand new starting offensive tackles, uh, it has not happened really that way yet in the playoff era. And that makes sense because you would say typically, well, you have a young quarterback, what are you going to do? We're going to protect him. We're going to protect our young quarterback and let him see the field and keep people off him and let him run the offense like you're in a simulation because you're going to be clean. Or we've got some new guys at tackle, but we have a quarterback back there who's going to solve problems. He's going to diagnose or he's going to get out of there with his legs or he's going to make unbelievable throws under pressure because he's going to hang in. He doesn't care if the tackle got beat. So to not have either of those, I think it is fair. I It has been pointed out to me that I am apprehensive about every new quarterback all the time. Because I was like, I don't know, Justin Fields. I don't know, yeah. man. And then I was like, I'm out. C.J. Stroud played two games, and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> you, and, were, you were with them, huh? Yeah. yeah. And then, but like, then it's like, then when they get good, then I'm like, oh, no, I'm back in. Yeah. So the idea that like, I, I am, I am truly uncertain about the quarterbacks. I am. Like, I can't help it. I'm not sure that it's correct. I'm not sure that it's warranted. But it, it's where I am. But it's magnified. And again, we've talked about this a lot. Like the idea that, okay, 2014 Ohio State plays a right tackle as a fifth-year senior and Daryl Baldwin, first-year starter, great. But Taylor Decker's on the left side. Yeah. 15, they do the same thing with Chase Ferris. Fifth-year senior, first-year starter, great. But Taylor Decker's on the left side. That you're doing it at both tackle spots. Yeah. And you don't – it's not that I don't think the quarterbacks for Ohio State can solve problems. I'm not sure right now how they're going to solve them. Yeah. Except maybe they solve them by being like, Marv, 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 and maybe that. Like, did you look up how many teams made the playoff with new quarterback, new tackles, and the best receiver in college football? I did not. Okay. That up, no. Let's okay. see. That would be a good immaculate grid also. If we could make yeah. a big grid of, like, <laughs> young tackles, name a young tackle who played with a 1,500-yard receiver. So, I think... The tackle quarterback conversation coupled together is right. I, th- I think that's the right way to think of it. But is that wrong? Because it's like, well, why would you talk about the tackles and the quarterback without talking about the receivers? Because it's like, hey, Marv, hey, Emeka, hey, Julian, hey, Cade, hey, Xavier. And you just get the ball out in three seconds and tell them to go crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's maybe why I am, I am not as nervous about the quarterback situation. I'm pretty nervous about the tackle situation. Like I I'm not saying they're going to be bad, but like it's pretty uncertain. It's let's it it could get hairy for them early, having to go on the road in the opener, having to go on the road in week four against Notre Dame, um, having to play like Wisconsin on the road. Like there could be some growing pains at that position. And there probably will be a quarterback too, but I just think like Ryan Day's track record of getting a young quarterback ready to play is just so strong that um I I think like at worst the quarterback play is like pretty good and, yeah and at best it's like excellent and among the best in the country i don't i don't think it gets even close to like average at all so um i don't worry about it but you're right i, I think you make a good point about like not knowing how these guys are going to figure things out ryan day said that is like we can throw in all kinds of situations of practice but they're not live so we don't know what they're going to do when someone's chasing them and trying to rip their head off and like that brings out a different thing in a player and um i think there's some people maybe who feel a little stronger that Devin Brown might be someone who's more willing to take on some of that because he's a better athlete than Kyle McCord. I think Kyle McCord's got a little gamesmanship to him too. So um, I don't, I'm curious about it. I don't know that I'm worried about it. Um, I'm a little worried about the tackle position for sure. So this was the interesting thing that happened about the tackle position. And I always am on alert for when coaches bring up a name unprompted because you can prompt somebody into saying anything. And if you put, depending especially with like a younger coach or a younger player, you can put a player's name in a question and then they repeat the name back to you. And then if you just want to write a story that's like, oh, this guy said it, it's like, well, you, you, you forced him into saying it. Ryan Day, unprompted, which is also a good name for a podcast, unprompted. Because most of what we say, like everything I say is unprompted. It's just out of nowhere, unprompted. With Philly Billy and French Vanilla. Okay, we're, 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 Kings of Columbus might not stick. We're finding some good ones here. He brings up Luke Montgomery, true freshman Luke Montgomery. 
I believe it may have been your tackle question. Yes. Hey, you're asking about you still asking about tackles and punters? You still oh, yeah. doing that kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I thought so. Yes. What did you think true freshman, highly rated recruit, Ohio Zone Luke Montgomery, mentioned by Ryan Day in the first chunk of the tackle conversation? What did you make of it? Um, I think it's interesting. So uh Grant Tutant and Avery Henry have been medically retired. They have like six tackles on the roster. <laughs> so like if you're naming the top four, there's only like two others you can't name. So I think that's maybe important to keep in mind the numbers at that position. Uh-huh. Um, like elevate a guy like Luke Montgomery a little bit. I don't say that to take away anything from Luke because I, I but, just, let me, he didn't say George Fitzpatrick. He did not say George Fitzpatrick. He did not say Zen Mahalski. Interesting though. Interesting enough. The four tackle names that he said were Josh Fryer, Josh Simmons, Tegra Shabola, and Luke Montgomery. Um and that's noteworthy. Uh, and I and I've said this on the daily, I think, um, and this like throughout the spring, like I didn't watch Luke Montgomery all that, um, all that much because he was like a third teamer. But I feel like every time I looked at him, like I caught a glance of something he was doing, he was doing something well. So I'm not necessarily surprised to hear that he has like caught Ryan Day's eye a little bit. Uh, I, I think it is highly unlikely that he will be in contention to actually start this year. And if he is, I think it's a problem. Um, but I think it is a good thing in the long run if he is like in the if he's a guy in the two deep who can live like the normal existence of a guy in the two deep, which is to get a little bit of a game experience as a true freshman, um, and then be ready to maybe start next year, even if that's at guard instead of tackle. Um, I think that's really good for Ohio State if he has to be thrust into a starting tackle job in 2023. Uh, that makes me increasingly nervous about the tackle position. Do you think he's a tackle or a guard long term? Uh. So a time ago, Berm uh, threw out the idea of Luke Montgomery playing center, and I have not been able to get it out of my head since then because he's so athletic, and I I, I like the idea of it. Um, Josh Myers was a tackle in high school, right? Yeah, and Luke is probably more fleet of foot than Josh was. He's not maybe as sawed off as Josh was. Um, he's not. He's like six five. Luke is, but he's got the length I think to play tackle. So I I think he can play tackle. I think. You know, right now, I, I would say that ultimately he finds his home at tackle, but I, I think he could be a guy who starts his career as a starter playing on the interior because they're more than likely going to have their two starting tackles back in 2024. So I like how it worked out because you were asking thoughtful questions about the tackle position, and then he said Luke Montgomery's name, and I was like, could he start? Because <laughs> I was like, yeah, you said his name. So... I did not like it when Michael Jordan started as a true freshman right. in 2016, 2016 yeah. because it was from desperation. And every conversation about Ohio State, whether it's rotating, whether it's playing young guys, all that matters, I think, is are you doing it from strength or are you doing it from weakness? So is there any <laughs> – I guess it's weakness. Like it's, it's like, oh, no, it's like a, it's from strength. Like – could Luke Montgomery be so good that it's like he's the best? Like he's one of our two best tackles. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Yes, we're we had a recruiting dip at tackle. We didn't get the the, the maybe the top end quality of guy in the portal that we were shooting for because Ryan Day was talking about that again on Wednesday. Basically said we looked at every guy in the portal that you could look at, and there are guys who went to Oregon or Florida State or are going to start at places that would be starting here. Is it po- like is it possible? So you sound. No, the idea of Luke Montgomery getting there in August and winning the job is not on your radar, really. I mean, it's more on my radar now than it was two hours ago. Okay. But, but um, I mean, not. we'll see. I don't know. I'd like to get out of practice maybe and see kind of how to utilize him. Like, are they throw him out there with the ones? And then let's have a conversation, I guess. And, look, like, freshmen start. Like, when I was going through looking at these playoff teams, there were a not insignificant number of freshman starters on the offensive line for some of these teams. I tackle specifically. Um, that went on to like be important starting tackles on teams that went to the college football playoff. So like, I'm not here to tell people that like Luke can't do it. Um, it just makes me because this is not the plan. This this has not been talked about prior to this point, and that's what makes me nervous. It's similar to Michael Jordan. We show up in the spring like, what Michael Jordan's starting that well, like who no one saw that coming. Um, and up until this point, it's like yeah, Josh Fryer and Josh Simmons are going to start. They got Josh Simmons for a reason. Luke, Josh Fryer played left tackle throughout the spring, and now it's like Luke Montgomery might play. And, and it's great for Luke. I hope I hope he pushes him for it, but. Um, deviation from the plan makes me a little nervous. Yeah. Um, there's a movie called Quick Change when Bill Murray's a clown. Oh, and yeah. They're running, and he says, this was not the plan. Yeah, isn't but, uh, Gina Davis in that movie? Oh, it's so good. So underrated. I would I would definitely recommend it. There's a lot of uh, 
Sometimes their noses are horns. There's a lot of lines <laughs> from Quick Change that I cite. I'm intrigued by it. Are you locked in on Josh Fryer at, le- at left tackle? Do you feel like there's not really a competition at left tackle? And then we'll see whether it's Josh Simmons, Zen Mahalski, Luke Montgomery, somebody else at right tackle. I mean, I don't know. I, I Yes, but I feel like... Tegra Shibola. Left out Tegra Shibola. Sorry. The only player that uh, in that conversation that has actually started games at the Power 5 level is Josh Simmons. So. Right. Like, I kind of feel like he should be the one that's entrenched, whether that's okay. on the left side or the right side, even though he's never played a snap for Ohio State and never practiced for Ohio State because he got here after spring ball. So, like, I I, I kind of feel like it's like Josh Simmons is going to play one of the spots, and then it's like Josh Fryer, Luke Montgomery, Tegger Shabola, and Mohowski, George Fitzpatrick. What do you got? We need another starter. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being, yes, it's definitely going to happen. One, it's not going to happen in a million years. What are the chances in your mind of us hitting a point like we did several years ago where we're in the middle of August practice and it's like, oh, we're changing the offensive line. Thayer Munford is going to play guard. Dewan Jones is going to be a tackle now. Like all this, boom, what we thought was the plan is no longer the plan. Oh, that's a good question. Because I, I actually think the most interesting person in that conversation is Matthew Jones and whether or not they want to put him at center. Because if they don't, then there's just not a lot of room for that kind of movement because um, their guards are entrenched. You, so, do you think are, – are you not 100% locked in on Carson Hinsman uh, at center? I, I thought they should have given – and maybe they did. Like, I'm not in the meetings. Um more of a consideration look, whatever you want to call it, to Matthew Jones is your center, Donovan Jackson's your left guard. Let's see how the rest plays out. And okay. I and I don't think they did that. Matthew Jones was a center in high school, was the best center prospect in his high school class. His entire career has been talked about as like the emergency center and has never played center. And like now there's an opening for him to play center and they're not putting him there. So it's just a little odd to me. And maybe he just like never took to it when he got to the college level. I, I don't know. He's a good guard. Um, and maybe you don't want to upset that either. But, um, I, I just don't like talking with Justin Fry in the spring. I, d- I don't think they want to move Matt to center. So if they're not going to do that, then I don't think we're going to look at like a whole set. Unless, unless that's the change two weeks in the camp. We're like, we got a problem. We got to move Matt. Um, okay. But I, I think that's like the only way it comes to fruition. What's your number? One is low, 10 is high. One is low, 10 is in high. a number? Uh, like a three. Okay. Yeah. What is, what is your alert level? This is not will it happen. This is your level of alert. And you can just use an adjective, not a number here. Of we show up and it's like we did it. We just weren't sure of anything else. Donovan Jackson's a left tackle. Uh, adjective. That's a describing word. Yeah, I'm trying to. We don't. We don't use uh, you know salty language on this podcast, so I'm trying to uh, avoid some of that. Would you be excited or I would, would you be, be like, oh wow, this is a problem? No, I think I'd be uh, downright ecstatic. They moved on to Jackson to left. Because because this is what because because when I was doing Brown stuff several years ago, they had like a I can't even remember who it was, but they had an undrafted guy who had had this weird winding path in college, and they were like, he's a left tackle. <laughs> and then they went through camp, and they were like, this is not working. <laughs> and they made all pro left guard Joel Batonio the left tackle for a little bit. And guess what? He was great at it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it wasn't a long term solution, but like. That's what I'm on alert for of we're just doing the best we can, and guess what? We can move Tegra Shabola to left guard. I think Tegra is a guard. I think he is too. Yeah. And it's like, if especially if it's like, well, we think Tegra might be one of the best five, and we know Donovan's, one of, Donovan's the best one. It's like, well, why would you play Tegra at tackle and Donovan at guard if you could put your best guy at tackle and put your other guy who's just winning a job in his most comfortable spot at guard – and all of a sudden, so I would say my, I think we might be at a seven of like, here's the starting offensive line for the first two weeks of camp. And then on the beginning of the third week of camp, three of the five spots change. And there's like a new guy in and two other guys have shifted position. Like I absolutely think that's possible because I just don't think they have a handle on it yet. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I do agree with that. So uh, let's, I want to game that out. Left tackle Donovan, left guard Tegra, center. So what if you said, I mean, I feel like the way Justin Fry's talked about Carson Hinsman, I've like 
written that off. I'm like, Carson Hinsman's a center. Yeah. But if you want to tell me that it's like, you know what, what? We have a veteran guy next to him. Why don't we play Carson at guard and play Matt at center and let right. Carson like learn how to be a lineman before he has to snap the ball? Like, that's lower on the list, but possible. Yeah, I think I, I asked this of Justin Fry in the spring. I think I asked him. Maybe somebody else said. I don't want to take credit for someone else's question, but I will. I asked Justin Fry in the spring um, whether or not the insistence on keeping Donovan and Matthew Jones at guard was to make sure that there weren't two new starters lined up next to each other. And maybe they would still want to avoid that. Like, I, I'll, I'll buy a little bit of the Carson Hinsman stock, too. So, like, I, I think it's more than likely he's a starting center for them. So then if, it, if you want to put Donovan to tackle, Tegra, Carson... So you have two new starters that are next to each other, Matt Jones at guard, and then Josh Fryer slash Josh Simmons whoever wins the job. I don't want to overdo like the blind side and the left tackle stuff, but if you just told me if if this was there's a five star at left tackle and the right tackle competition is Josh Fryer, Josh Simmons, Tegra Shabola, Zen Mahalski, and we're gonna pick the best one of those four, I'd be like, okay. Yeah. And I, I, I'm good with that. And I do like Ryan, Ryan did say a thing on Wednesday, like, he opened the door to, I, I don't know if rotating is the right word, but he's like, we're going to play a lot of guys on the offensive line. You, we hope to play a lot of guys on the offensive line. Cause I, and I think it goes back to what you said, like, I don't, I don't think they quite have a handle on it yet. And do you mix and match on the road against Indiana? I, I don't know. It's not the most uh, daunting road environment. It's probably going to feel more like a home game or just wearing different colored jerseys. And then you get Youngstown State and Western Kentucky. Like, I think you can play around with it a little bit. Yeah. To try to figure out the right combo going to South Bend. He definitely, when he was talking about Luke Montgomery, he he said, I told Luke Montgomery, you have to be ready to compete. And then he said, does that mean he would be ready like week one? Maybe not, but like week three, week four. <laughs> and it was like, so you're getting ready for Luke Montgomery to start against Notre Dame. Okay. <laughs> like that's, that's what we're doing here. I don't, I'm just trying to parse. I'm trying to f- read between the lines. Yeah. It felt uncertain. So sometimes you get through spring, you go on vacation, you reevaluate, you and Justin Fry have deep talks in the middle of the night, and you come back, and at this unveiling of the season, it feels like, okay, we still have a competition ahead of us, but we have a, we have a handle on this. I didn't, when it comes to the offensive line, I don't know that I've sensed handle. I sensed more like, okay, we still got some stuff to figure out. Yeah, but not panic. No, yeah. I think that's an important distinction. Not panic, but continued uncertainty. Yeah, which at a certain point, I guess, becomes panic. <laughs> but, but. Uh, yeah, hey, uh, when does uncertainty turn into panic? <laughs> like uh, the third quarter against Notre Dame when yeah. you're down 10 and you can't protect your quarterback? Yeah, but like, right, and, I think on July 26th, it's not necessarily. No, and I don't think it should be. So as we're trying to have a discussion about whether their offensive personnel is good enough, it is remarkable the idea that like every single person in the receiver room is back. Yeah, like it's not, and the, and running back room and Cade Stover. Like a year ago, we were like, I don't know, he's a linebacker, linebacker playing tight end, and now it's like, oh, it's Cade Stover. So like the skill stuff is, it's the best skill in the country, is it not? Can we say that definitively? Uh, show me a team that's better. I got yeah, I, it has to be. So they have the best skill in the country. And uh, a five star and another really veteran guy on the offensive line is some questions elsewhere. Is their personnel as we sit here in July good enough for them to contend very strongly? Offensive personnel good enough to contend contend for a national title? Yeah, I think so. I think that I think the state of the offensive line could make things um, what's the right word? Maybe like a little uneasy early on. And and like uneasy can mean like you lose at Notre Dame, um, but it doesn't derail your season. And I and, and I, I guess I would use a 2014 offensive line as, as kind of the template for that. Like that was not a very good offensive line early in the year, and they were like they switched the side that Billy Price played because he couldn't figure out on one side of guard to move him to the other. Like there might be a little bit of that. But by the end of the year, they were awesome. Yep. So um, I think that's out there for the line, and if it is, then like the rest of it's great. Okay, let's do defensive personnel because again, I'm just. Sometimes people say, this is, I guess, what reporting is. People say interesting things, and it changes your view of the world. Jim Knowles, when we talked to him, we talked to coaches after spring practice. So that was like late April, early May, when we got all the assistants. Jim Knowles talked then, defensive coordinator Jim Knowles, also from Philly. Philly Jimmy, to differentiate from Philly Billy, talked about that he is open to playing more guys in the back end because he had talked about sort of back seven, he doesn't want to rotate. 
he wanted that when he got here, he's like, I want to find my guys and play them. And then he's like, you know what? I think I kind of maybe changed my mind on that. There's been a long discussion around Ohio State about Larry Johnson rotating players on the defensive line. And Ryan Day, unaparampated, came out and listed six defensive one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. seven defensive linemen, three edge guys, and four tackles. And he said, basically, we need our best guys to play a lot of reps. And it felt like he was talking to all the Ohio State fans who over the years have been like, why is JT Tui Marlow out not on the field in the fourth quarter? Yeah. So he mentioned JT Tui Marlow out, Jack Sawyer, and Kenyatta Jackson, who I could not be more fired up for Kenyatta Jackson. And Ryan Day also said Kenyatta Jackson looks like an NFL player. And I was like, yes, yes, because I've picked the wrong guy. <laughs> I think we might steal this. I mean, it's my thing, it's so we'll thing. take it. You're driving the bus for a guy? Yeah. In the off, like, I'm, this is my guy. I'm like, oh, for the last five off seasons. <laughs> my Court Williams bus is pretty empty at this point. It's mostly injuries, good but guy, though. Good, I, guy. I, yeah. good guy. Just so, but I'm at the front of the Kenyatta Jackson bus driving it. So th- those three edge guys, and then at tackle, not surprisingly, my call, my call, Ty Hamilton, Ty Leak Williams. Did he mention? Maybe it was only six because he didn't say Taiwan didn't Malone say in there. Malone. Okay, so it was only six. He said three tackles, players. three edge guys. But that idea, like that's purposeful, is it not? And that's like yeah. would be, well, this is what Larry Johnson might want to do, but I'm the head coach and I'm telling you I want JT and Jack to play 65 snaps because if you look at Chase Young's snaps in 2019, he did play a lot. Yeah. So sometimes you play your dudes. I don't know if Ryan Day, if it's philosophical, if it's dudosophical, like we have dudes play the dudes because they, they might have three first-round picks in the defensive line. What did you make of it? Uh, I thought it was an interesting thing to say unprompted. Um, it was certainly intentional. I think it's right. Um, I and Austin has been at the front of this bandwagon. Like they just they rotate. I think they over rotate. Um, or maybe over rotate's not the right word, but it's not it's not calculated enough when they do it. Um, there doesn't really seem to be any rhyme or reason to it. And like they're going to need more than six defensive linemen throughout the course of the season. Um, but when the money's down. Those are your six. Maybe it's seven with Tywin Malone. Maybe it's eight if Caden Curry comes along yep. or Amari Abor. Um, I think the group can get larger than six. Um, but you need to you need to have a delineation there. I, I didn't feel like there was one last year. It was just sort of like it was it was the personnel was treated as if everyone was equal and they weren't. Right. Um, and I think the group as a whole is better this year. I think there are more guys probably that are in that upper tier of defensive linemen than there were last year. But you got to play them. Like you got to, you got to treat them as such. And and I think that's what Ryan Day was saying. Where are you on a Rushman third down and long package of Jack Sawyer and Kenyatta Jackson on the edge and JT Tumolo out and Mike Hall inside? I'm for it. I am yeah, so time. for it. I love Kenyatta Jackson's bend. His bend made me swoon. He's a different kind of guy than they've had there. Like he, I, he is not Chase Young because I would never want to put those expectations on somebody. But I don't think they have had an end with the get off and bend combination to win that edge quickly. I think a lot of the guys they've had have had to win more with like power. Um, and Kenyatta 255 is a strong cat, but I think he's more of a like pure speed guy than they've had in the last couple of years. I don't think it's fair to, like you said, and you're not doing that. You can't compare him to Chase Young. So we're not going to do that. I think he's Miles Garrett. So <laughs> that, I was like, that bend looks familiar. Uh oh. I think the secondary, Ryan Day, I don't know if Ryan Day said a word about linebackers or secondary because I don't think anybody asked about it. He was not asked about it. But I think the secondary is potentially somewhere between very good and excellent. Where are you on the secondary? Um, In the same spot. The only thing that um, gives me a little bit of hesitancy is, like, what are they going to do with the safeties? Um, Because, like, this is my personal opinion. Like, we've had conversations about it. I think Austin Byrne feel a little bit differently. I want to see... Jahad Carter, Sonny Styles, and Lathan Ransom. That's what I want to see. And if they do that with the corners they have, I'm good. I think they can be excellent. If they decide to rotate guys in, play guys just because they're older, because they paid their dues, because they want to stick around, um, I think they will lower the ceiling of the defense. I think the three-man corner rotation of Denzel Burke, Jordan Hancock, and Davis and Igman Nosen has a chance to remind us of the days of yore at corner. I yes? I agree, yep. And do you have fears about Sonny Styles not playing enough? Yes. Yeah. How? 
one to ten. One is like, eh, I'm kind of worried. Ten is like, I'm freaking out. My God, please play the talented young guy. What are you? Like a five and a half. Yeah. Okay. Like, and I, it's hard because I know we, you lump in CJ Hicks and, and Sonny Styles, I think justifiably a lot, except CJ Hicks has steel chambers in front of him and Sonny Styles, yes. I don't think, has the similar kind of block. Yeah. And I would like to see CJ Hicks play as well. When I, when we got Jim Knowles, I like walked in May. We were up in the team room. Do people know that we get to uh, interview in the team room up where they had this, uh, the the uh, Gatorade machine? Yeah, we've done some shows up there. What, what do you mean you did shows up there? Yeah, uh, you guys like do you have a key to the Woody? What are you talking about? Uh, ask uh, forgiveness, not permission. Can I get a key to the Woody now that I'm here? Thumbprint. Okay. I walked Jim Knowles to the stairwell with my theory of it's not a theory with my. Raquan McMillan, Curtis Grant in 2014, senior and freshman. They were middle linebackers, so it's not the same, but Steel Chambers is Curtis Grant. C.J. Hicks is Raquan McMillan. If you go back and look at the snaps from 2014 between Curtis Grant and Raquan McMillan, they're like practically exactly the same, mm-hmm. and they managed to find a balance between a senior and a freshman and play them both, and all they did was win the national championship, and then Raquan went on to be awesome. Yeah. And so... I'm in very invested in, like, it's nothing against Steel Chambers, but, like, I kind of want to see C.J. Hicks on the field, but I have similar vibes with Styles and Hicks of, like, what are we doing? This is what you do. And it goes back to a ruthless conversation that we had about Ryan Day and about you just got to play your best guys and, like, it can't be all about saying yard. And I'm not saying that those older guys can't help you. Do you look at Sonny Styles and C.J. Hicks at all in the same way, or do you? is it completely different because Steel Chambers is an established, good Big Ten linebacker in front of C.J. Hicks, whereas if they're not playing Sonny Styles, it, I think they're getting in their own way more. Yeah, I think I think they're different. I, I, and I used to lump them together, and I, I have tried to stop because because of that. I, like, Steel's good. Um, Steel, and I didn't cover, my first year was 2014, so I didn't cover Curtis Grant prior to that year, but Steel is better now than like Curtis Grant. Ever yes. Was, right. Correct. Yeah. So, um, I, I think they're different. I, I would like to see, um, maybe CJ play some of those Cody Simon snaps. Although Cody Simon was very good on that role last year. Um, maybe you rotate that a little bit, um, work CJ in at the Jack position, get him in some in steel spot. But like, I also think steel has played very well at that position and has earned the majority of his snaps there. Whereas like there isn't, oh, they have one returning starter at safety. Sonny styles is a unicorn. And they are getting in their own way if they don't embrace that. There was, um, what was I watching? We did a, a, a rewatch on, it must have been, no, it was. It was the 98 Michigan State Ohio State game. And it was the final Buckeye Retalkables that I was part of. We just did it a couple weeks ago. And Damon Moore had a pick in that game for Ohio State. I think it was the only points they scored in the second half where he just like, shot in front of the receiver and cut off the play and like picked it off and ran it back for pick six. And I was like, Sonny, <laughs> like that's what I, cause he, a Sonny Styles had to play like that in the spring game. I think where he read the route, jumped the route. I think maybe he didn't catch it, but it was like, okay, some of that please. Because as much as I, th- I think there's a lot of reason to believe in what they're saying about year two of the Jim Knowles defense. A lot of that makes sense. There's also like, who are your dudes? And if we're playing, Name that dude in the back end. Like, it's just like, who has a chance? Like, like who's your Ryan Chazier? Yeah. Who's your Malik Hooker? Like, who is the dude who is an absolute difference maker? Like, Sonny's high on that list, isn't he? He is. And I think maybe, and Jim Knowles addressed some of this when we talked to them in, in May, um, that Sonny opened his eyes a little bit with what he could do playing more of the, the deep middle or, or the deep half of the field. Uh, there is some part of me that wonders if if he can actually do that at a high level or if he's more an in the box kind of guy, I, I don't know. I would love to, I want to see him get the shot to do it all. Um, but it might work out that he is more of like an in the box kind of guy. Um, and if that's the case, then I guess you got to package that a little differently. I don't know. It might work out that like their three best safeties are all three guys who are better playing down in the box. And it's like, well, I don't know what you're doing when that's, when that's the case. Um, but yeah, I, I want them to, take the reins off of Sonny early, and if they feel like they need to pull back, then pull back, but like, don't start from that position. We are sitting right now as we record on a field where if in 2013 Ohio State had let it rip and played freshman Vaughn Bell after Christian Bryant get hurt, got hurt, they might have made the national championship game instead of sticking with veteran safeties and then deciding to play Vaughn Bell in the Orange Bowl when it was too late and it was like, oh, the guy had an interception. That's pretty good. Huh? Pretty good. Vaughn Bell. I don't think that's a terrible comparison for Sonny Styles because Vaughn 
back in that defense, Vaughn was like down in the box. He's like a nickel corner some of the time, but he'd also come up and hit you. Then you let like Tyvis kind of roam back behind it. And like they were a really good safety combo. And Vaughn Bell is a freaking baller, man. Like I, if we're playing like most underrated Ohio State Buckeyes of this century, I think Vaughn Bell might be high on that list because everybody knows Vaughn Bell is good. I think Vaughn Bell was like awesome. Yeah, but there was just a bunch of guys on that defense. Uh, yeah. Team who were awesome. Yeah. So anyway. All right. So defensive personnel, good enough to win a national championship. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about coaching on the offensive side of the ball. Ryan Day, again, I am completely for what Ryan Day is planning to do in handing over play calling. I think Ryan Day needs to be more CEO, more culture coach, more getting a grasp on everything that's happening and not being play sheet guy, not being I'm in the off. And again, I, I, when I was at Cleveland.com last year, I had was given the granted very kindly by Ohio State the opportunity to sit in on an offensive meeting, a game planning meeting. And Ryan Day's in the back with the pointer. He has the laser pointer, and he's in the back of the room, and they're talking about blocking angles. They're running through all the plays of practice, the plays that they're running in practice that they're getting run in the game. And Ryan, Ryan Day, the guy in charge of everything, has the laser pointer and is pointing it like, okay, is this guy's arm on this block? And then Justin Fry is getting up and going up to the board and like acting it out. But it's the head coach who's in charge of everything with a laser pointer in his hand. So that, to me, is really what the conversation is about. Who has is, the laser pointer? Who has the laser pointer? Because I don't think Ryan Day should be in that meeting. Or he shouldn't be in that meeting every single night for two hours going over practice film with the offensive staff when he could be meeting individually with players, talking to the defensive staff, dealing with NIL, whatever. Like all the other things a head coach has to do. So this whole Brian Hartline conversation, to me, is a lot of that. Who's got the laser pointer in the room? But And Ryan Day talked about that. So didn't Ryan Day on Wednesday was saying it's really about right the things that you have to do as the offensive coordinator during the week with – staff alignment and install and all those things that really is a lot of the lift of a coordinator. Yeah, I actually think that, and like I think Ryan Day's uh, he's a really good play caller who a game or two has maybe gotten his own way a little bit, but he's I think he's an excellent play caller. I think what he is better at is like the organizational skills of being an offensive coordinator. Like the, we've gone to the coaches clinics, we've seen him do the stuff with the, with the buckets and the way they organize their, their play calls. You probably saw some of that when you were Yep. There too, like the way they pull stuff out, um, how much film he watches, how how he studies defense. Like he is an organized dude. Like, that, that is how he got to where he is now. Um, and I, I'm not saying that Brian Hartline is not. Um, he is an excellent tactician at the receiver position. Um, maybe in that existence, you don't have to be quite as organized as as Ryan Day has been at Ohio State, which has benefited the program incredibly well. Um, so I think that like Brian Hartline can call. You know, play action, shot play. I think he has. I think he probably has a good enough feel being a football player to know like when to call what. I think it's the Monday through Friday stuff of the coordinator that is the biggest adjustment for him, or will be. So Ryan Day on Wednesday, in talking about Brian Hartline being the offensive coordinator and the play caller, was still in the if zone. Mm -hmm. I think more in the if zone. He felt like more in the if zone now than he was in the spring. Yes, that felt like a thing to me. Yeah. Which I'm not, I'm not totally surprised by, and honestly, like I have, I've changed my mind on this probably like ten times in the last six months. Um, because after the Michigan game, I was all in. It's like he got, he's got to give it up. Then he called a great game against Georgia. I was like, okay, yeah. like if that guy shows up every week, or if that guy more specifically shows up against Michigan, uh, great, let him do it. Like I, I don't know, like it's, it's hard. Like I, it, as as difficult, and you can see it on his face. Like it's a really hard decision for him to even like think about giving that up. Yeah. And like I kind of feel the same way. It's like I don't know, man. I don't know what I would do because like it's it's what got you here and it's what you do like best. Um, and it's like a pretty pivotal season. And like, do you really want to give it to a guy? Like, oh, totally give it to a guy who's never done it before, a brand new quarterback. I don't know. I don't think I would. He said it's going to be hard for me to give it up. He said like things he said before, but. I thought maybe, because I think all this kind of stuff when we discuss this, when you're coming off a news conference and you're trying to read into what a person said, you have to think what else they could have said. Because a lot of times, 
people people make a big deal about oh this person said this it's like well, what else were they going to say yeah you painted them into a corner and forced them to say it and then you're like i can't believe they said that it's like anybody would have said that he could have come could he i'll ask you could ryan day off his summer vacation have come in here and said I feel great about where our offense is. I'm really excited with what we're going to do. I know Brian Hartline is going to do a great job. It's really hard for me to let this go, but I'm ready to let it go. I think it's the best thing for our team. Brian Hartline showed me he could handle it in the spring, and we're going into preseason camp with Brian Hartline calling the plays, and I'm fired up about that. Could he have said that? Yep. Didn't say that? Nope. Does that matter that he didn't say that? No. Do you think he's... Do you think he's leaving his options open still? Do you think he has not fully decided? I think he has not decided yet. I think he they went through the spring and did like the game like scenarios and tried to figure it out. They'll do more of that in camp. Um, I, what I think is going to happen is that he will not give it up, but he will find pockets within games to hand. The you are predicting. You are predicting here today. On the debut episode of Philly Billy and French Vanilla, that Ryan Day will not fully give up play calling this season. Not this year. I think next year. I think he needs to shepherd Brian Hartline through this. But I think, I, and really to me, it's about the lift. It's about your time during the week. I and think I feel like he's prepping all that. I think he's got a better grasp on that though. They had a lot of stuff to figure out with the NIL. They did, and I feel like they have, at least for this cycle. Um, I feel like they still need some culture reinforcement. They were they did not play their best game from a mental emotional standpoint against Michigan. And I think everything yeah. that Ryan Day is doing. So here's the thing. I'm going to continue talking about parallel paths this entire season. There's the beat Michigan path and there's the win the national championship path. They are both important. They are not the exact same thing. I think the win the national championship path is more of a scheme thing is more of a you would want your best play caller in that situation because man we got to scheme it up if we're going to beat Georgia or Bama or who we're going to face out in the world right we've got to because one play call can make the difference the Michigan path to me is an intangibles path is more of like we've got to be in the right mindset we've got to have the right approach and and the the deal is you want Ryan Day leading both I think you want him leading the you want him driving the car on the Michigan Intangibles Highway, and you want him driving the car on the scheming it up to beat Georgia and Bama and win the national championship highway. But you can't drive two cars at the same time. So, but didn't he against Georgia? So, I so he did against Georgia after they crashed the Michigan yeah. Intangibles car. Yeah. He like got out of the wreckage of the Michigan Intangibles car and it was like, I'm going to go over and get in this Georgia <laughs> car. And then they were awesome. Yeah. So does that mean now, okay, they did it against Georgia. Does that mean that the Michigan Intangibles highway is okay? I think, I think in loss, obviously they didn't win that game. I think, I think he might have found the balance that he was missing going into. I, I think perhaps he was so intent because that he like he had Don Brown's number. Yep. And I think, you know, he got he got beat by Mike McDonald. I don't know if he got out schemed in Ann Arbor or not, but maybe he felt that way. Um, and perhaps he got so lost in the scheme highway of outsmarting Mike McDonald that he forgot about the other part. And then I think going into the Georgia game, he kind of married the two. Okay. I think when we talk about do there is their offensive coaching good enough to win the national championship or be a strong contender for the national championship? This is why we're talking about this part of it because my answer to the question is yes. Like, can you check this, this box? Yes. But it's the way that you're assigning that offensive personnel. The devil's in the details. And so I will also say... I just can't help it. I have some apprehension about quarterback, even though I, I actually think it probably is unwarranted. The idea that, like, listen, man, all the first year Ryan Day starting quarterbacks have been great is probably the right answer, but I can't help it. I have some apprehension about a handoff. I do. Because I think the thing you said is it actually would make more sense. And I, do you think Brian Hartline is at all comparable to Urban Meyer? 
in their career paths and some of the things they do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I see what you're saying. If yeah. And my point is, like, Urban was never a coordinator. Urban went from receivers coach to head coach. Urban is structure, culture, motivation, recruiting, all those things. And it doesn't mean that Urban Wire wasn't one of the leaders in the offensive, spread offense era. He was, and Urban can scheme it up, too. But if you were going to list, like, Urban's five best attributes, I don't think schemer, at least by the time he got to Ohio State, but I even think early in his career, they didn't out-scheme people at Bowling Green. He willed them to beat yeah, Missouri, right, right. right? I think Brian Hartline's a little more like that. I don't know that I would put schemer on the list of Brian Hartline's best attributes. Tactician, technician, in terms of teaching the receiver position. Details. De- yeah. t- ability to connect with receivers and recruits and families. Motivate, create an atmosphere of success in a room balance egos and have Marvin Harrison Jr. get up here on Wednesday and say the best thing that ever happened to me was to come here as a freshman and not play. It was awesome. Yeah. Not playing was awesome. He's like, I get it if some guys want to go play, but I'm telling you, come here and don't play. <laughs> the best receiver in college football made a pitch on Wednesday that was, if you're a young high school receiver who wants to be great, come to Ohio State and don't play. <laughs> That's Brian Hartline. Yeah. But I think Ryan Day... For as much of a culture guy Ryan Day is, if we were going to say Ryan Day attributes, wouldn't you put schemer pretty high? X and O guy pretty high? I'd put it first. Yeah. So the hard part of this is a guy that you would put schemer X and O, number one on his list of attributes, I want him to give up play calling to over to a guy who I wouldn't put schemer X and O, number one on his list of attributes, so Ryan Day can focus more on culture, which he's good at, but is not what he's number one at. If it was reversed, if it's Brian Hartline handing it over to Ryan Day, do it yesterday. Right. I'm I'm Brian Hartline. I took over for Urban Meyer. I've got this thing going on. Like when Urban brought in Tom yeah. Herman, Tom Herman's like, I'm in Mensa. Let me draw some stuff up. Right. I have a little uncertainty about that transition of will it 1,000% be great right now, but I just feel like they need to play their best game from an intangible standpoint on the last Saturday, November against Michigan. And I think maybe if the head coach is calling plays, that makes it harder to do. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I would have agreed with you had we not seen the Peach Bowl, but I don't like. I don't or like had not seen what they did to Clemson in the Sugar Bowl in 2020. Um, I just think like Ryan Day can really tap into that when he when he is focused on the right things. So I. I I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I have as much trepidation about it, maybe. But So you don't have trepidation, but do you have trepidation if it's handed off? If Brian Hartline's a play caller this year? I think I, I think my position as being less trepidatious is because I don't think he's going to get a handoff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not worried because I don't, I don't think, think it's, it's happening. Right. <laughs> Where I'm saying, like, I'm right. a little worried because I think it is right. going to happen because yeah. it's the plan. Yeah. All right, 1 to 10. 1 is like, yeah, I'm just kind of saying stuff for podcast content. You know, we've got to get some listeners. Hey, thanks for coming to the show. Landis says this. That's one. Ten is, I bet it. I'm putting Philly Millie, Philly Billy hard cash money on Ryan Day's call and plays against Notre Dame. Where are you? One to ten. Eight. Wow. Okay. I like it. All right. Offensive coaching is good enough for them to contend for strongly for national title. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it is. Defensive coaching. Tim Walton, Perry Eliano, Larry Johnson, Jim Knowles. Year two of Jim Knowles, which we talked about all spring. Year two of Jim Knowles, year two of Jim Knowles, you're in, you're there, they're there, coaching, defensive coaching, or you have some questions? Um, I have some questions. I don't know I don't know that I check that box as quickly as I've checked the others. I think you can probably get me there. Um uh, like year two, Jim Knowles go track record, Duke, Oklahoma State, both got better. Year one to year two, Ohio State is starting from a much better position than either of those two teams were uh, in their second year than Jim Knowles. I think they take a little bit of a step forward. Um, I think I think Jim Knowles and Ryan Day need to get on the same page about when to dial it up, when to dial it back, um, game control kind of stuff. Um, but I think they might be able to get that figured out. I'm not too worried about that. Um, I, th- I think the defensive line play has been underwhelming the last few years. Um, I love the personnel. I think it's really good. I think it's as good as it's been probably since like 2017. Um, or I don't know, if Chase Young, 2019. But um, it's good. Will it be maximized? I don't know. Um, will the corner, like the corner personnel, will it be maximized? I don't know. Uh, 
Same with the safeties. Like, Perry Liano was a great cornerbacks coach at Cincinnati. I don't know if he's a great safeties coach yet. Maybe he will be. Um, so I have some questions about it. I think um, a lot of those concerns can be wiped away relatively early in the season if they come out rocking on defense early on. But that's kind of where I'm at going into it. It's hard because I think a lot of times people in life don't. It's like it's why we call changing your mind waffling. It's like, well, you thought one thing and now you think a different thing. It's like instead of viewing that as growth, we too often view that as being namby pamby, right? Yeah. I was encouraged, but also maybe slightly surprised in May the way Jim Knoll sort of talked about. Yeah, you know, I kind of didn't know it was going to go that way, right? Like just sort of like his understanding of the personnel here, the way to use personnel, how many risks to take versus not. It, it feels like I thought he was talking in a way that like I learned a lot, which I, I think is good, but I also was a little surprised of like, oh, I like you've been doing this a long time and there's some good players here. And they're, the defensive talent was still down. I think they still were part of that rut last year. I think – the rut's over, and we already covered defensive personnel is good enough. Is that um, what did you make of that? How did that affect your view of all this? Um, I, it actually made me like we don't know enough about Jim Knowles. I think maybe to know his willingness or capability to adapt. Yeah, um, it it encouraged me a little more in that regard. I, I think like I think he's a guy who like truly like goes through things and takes lessons from them and then applies them to future endeavors. Um, so. I thought it was interesting that he was like sort of so honest in that way because coaches typically aren't. Um, That's what they get for being honest. Yeah, I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with you? Right. So um, I took that like mostly as 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 a good thing. As long as like, I mean, that, I'll have to be right in my assumption that he will actually take those lessons learned and apply it and be better this year. But I kind of think he will. I just like have that picked up that vibe from him. But are you withholding your check mark for defensive coaching? I am withholding my check mark. Wow. Or maybe if I were put. That's all- brutal. If I put all the other check marks in pen, I would put that one in pencil. I can just imagine of a point in your life when someone stared into your eyes and said, Philly Billy, I love you. Do you love me? And you said, I am withholding my check mark. <laughs> that is absolutely brutal. Okay, I'm giving him a check mark. I think the defense has a chance to make a jump. Let's finish with intangibles. Just as like, this is a lot of it as applies to Michigan. I, to me, a lot of this, what this is in the end is, your ability to be as good as you are when it matters the most, right? So whatever that means, mental, emotional, putting yourself in a frame of mind to not have regrets because sometimes you just lose. Sometimes you just lose. But sometimes you go, ugh, that wasn't us. Yeah. Do you think they are in the right frame of mind as a program to be able to check that box this year? I think they're in a really good spot, yes. Um, I think they learned a lot about themselves last year the transition from Michigan to Georgia, I think they'll bottle that up a little bit and, and be able to sustain it over the course of this year. The thing that gives me a little bit of pause, because I, I think it's so important to, to this conversation, is like we don't know how, let's just say it's Kyle McCord, how he will respond like when he gets hit in the mouth. Like I don't I don't know. Like you knew how JT Barrett was going to respond. I, I think honestly you knew how CJ Stroud was going to respond. And sometimes frankly it wasn't all that well. Um I don't know about I don't know about the, whoever the quarterback is this year and how that how that will play out. So that gives me not a ton, not a ton of pause, but a little bit. Um, but largely, I I think I would check this box. I think they I think they have gone through a period of introspection um, from Ryan Day on down about what derailed them last year and what can't happen to them this year. I'm going to ask you one more quarterback question at the end for the people who hung on back in. Uh, they used to do this for us, like back in. Um, 2009 or 2010, if you came in to talk to the assistant coaches on a Wednesday evening, it's like, yeah, hey, who showed up to talk to Jim Bowman? And then they like would open a door and Terrell Pryor would walk in. It would be like, <laughs> here's your reward. You came out for Jim Bowman and here's Terrell Pryor. So if you lasted this long on this show and on this podcast, I'll ask you now about the quarterback situation. Ryan Day said it's close. Do you believe him? Yeah, I believe him. I still, I believe Kyle McCord will still be the starter, but I, do you think Devin Brown still can be the starter? <sighs> yeah, but like I would be if you put, like put me on a one to ten, I'd be like a two. I think. Okay, I really, I mean, there's you know, it's one of these things. We all have a million questions for Ryan Day. He talked for forty five minutes, but he also talked a bunch of other places. He talked to Austin Ward. 
for for our show here on the podcast. Like we had a million different things. Um, what does close mean? <laughs> like, yeah. and and how do you like all those? So, uh, but we have all August to figure that out. Yeah. Well, the one thing I will say, like, it's not. I think I think close in in the spring is like mostly lip surface to make sure guys don't transfer. Yeah. Close in August, I think means close. Yeah. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I'm still I still wonder like I to me Devin Brown getting hurt at the end of spring I think almost maybe helped him more than it hurt him because it was like well, I don't know. Like Ryan Day said on Wednesday it's like well he's never I wanted to see him play in the spring game. Yeah. So there wasn't really an opportunity for Kyle McCord to go out and win the job because yeah, Devin no Brown didn't show up for the you know couldn't be out there. So I almost think like that's it's, uh, to me, that's what I would want to think of. Like, well, I like I, I can't make a final decision because I haven't seen the full Devin Brown yet, and yeah. I at least need to see that. Yeah, I think he feels a responsibility to let Devin back into it. Yeah, um, which I think is, I think it's good for them. I think I think it'll push Kyle, and and I think it it gives Devin a fair shot at winning the job. But I still think Kyle's going to win. Okay, that'll wrap up this debut episode. We're gonna do this. Um, not every day, but fairly often Mm -hmm. where Bill and I will sit down. We'll go longer. We may even go longer than this on future pods, but it's great to, uh, it's great to be podding with you again, brother. Really happy about it. Uh, it's been a long time coming and I will just tell you the story of there I was, we were in a Fort Worth hotel room or Dallas hotel room. And we had gone out and, uh, had a lovely day going to the chip and Joanna store. We did. We went to the, the, uh, the silos. Yeah. yeah. What's the name of that store? What's the name, the uh, name of the show is like Mag- fix my house. What's it called? Fixer up. Fix my house. Fixer, Fixer upper. upper. Yeah. We, we went, we were like just the happiest couple in Texas going to, uh, to the fixer upper store, I bought something for for my wife. Did you buy something? I have a for, coffee mug I still use yeah. to this day. Fixer upper, and then we came back and we're in the hotel room, and somebody from the athletic called Landis, and I was like, "He's leaving me." <laughs> it was like our last date. I thought maybe we were going to get engaged, and then you were like, "I'm out," <laughs> and I said, "I cannot believe this is happening." So I'm never going to the fixer upper store with you again because <laughs> only bad things happen when it happens. Okay, thanks you guys for making us part of your Ohio State fandom. For Philly Billy, I'm French Vanilla, and that was Kings of Columbus.